Tonight on Greater Boston, I'm Sue O'Connell in for Jim Browdy. With less than six months to go until the midterm elections, I'm joined by the authors of Dirt Road Revival, who lay out why they believe winning over rural communities is a key to Democrats' success. Then, Milton moms making their rock star dreams come true. I'm joined by members of the pandemic form band, The Lazy Susans, on the heels of their national TV debut. When Donald Trump won the presidency in 2016, many Democrats were baffled as to what went wrong. But a new book purports to have the key to the problem and the solution. Dirt Road Revival lays out the roadmap for how Democrats can rebuild rural politics and why the authors believe the party's future depends on it. The pair behind it join me now, Chloe Maximum was the first Democrat ever elected to represent her district when she joined the State House in 2018, also making history as the youngest female state legislator in Maine's history, going on to beat the incumbent Senate Minority Leader in 2020, and Canyon Woodward was her campaign manager through it all. Welcome to both of you. Thanks so much for joining me. First, I want to set the table a little bit. Can you, can you tell me what flavor Democrats you are? If someone were to ask you what kind of Democrat you are, what would you say? I think we're we're progressive young folks who grew up in in rural conservative communities, and we really love where we're from, and we also really love the progressive movement and the Democratic Party and, and all that it stands for. I I don't know if we have all the answers, but we certainly learned a lot on the campaign trail in our districts, and that's what the book is about. And Canyon, it's important to note you, you're not people who have just swooped in. Uh, to Maine or just swooped in from the big city to share your expertise. You're both born and bred in rural areas, right? Yeah, that, that, that's right. I grew up in a, in a super rural part of Southern Appalachia and, and we both, yeah, we both spent our whole lives being, being raised by these communities and, and felt the call back very strongly. So I'm old enough to remember Dale McCormick, uh, who was uh, a Maine um, state treasurer. She was also, I think she's now a city councilor, an openly lesbian uh, person who went campaigning in, in Maine and uh, actually ran for Congress and almost won. And during her campaign, I remember speaking with her and her sharing with me the interactions she had while she was campaigning across the state. Uh, both uh, when she was uh, a state representative and as well as running for Congress. Um, Chloe, can you share with me what some of the interactions you have had while you've been campaigning that might not be fitting with what some people think rural voters are, are, are concerned about or caring about? Sure thing. Yes. Yes, I know of Dale and know we, we both come from, from movements that have a long and proud history and also are organizing right now with so many people doing incredible work in rural communities. And, you know, what, what we found in, in our campaigns, as we talked with so many Republicans and independents who had never been contacted by a Democratic candidate or canvasser in their entire voting history, you know, we found a lot of common ground and we would have Trump signs next to Chloe signs and and just and just had incredible conversations that changed my perspective as a progressive person really understanding um folks who think differently than me which is which is really okay you know that's that's a part of what makes this country so great and it was it was uncovering that common ground that was that was really really hopeful and just kind of a, a, a wake up call of, of how much work we we have to do across the country. What is some of that common ground, Chloe? If someone has a Trump sign up and a sign up for you, um, where where do you overlap on things that you care about and the constituent cares about? You know, I, I found so much common ground on, on many, many issues. You know, I, I can't remember talking to a single Republican who wanted healthcare to be more expensive. And on a higher level, I found so much empathy and and just shared understanding of a frustration with our political system and how much I as a young person and, and these folks in, in rural conservative places just really feel like government has let us down, you know, on, on, on every level. And that's why I ran for office and I found that that shared solidarity. 
solidarity with the folks that I was talking to as well. Kenyon, uh, from the organizing and the campaign standpoint, in the in the book, you, you guys write a lot about, um, you know, we're, and we're going to get into it in just a second, but what the Democrats should be doing in, in order to stay engaged with these rural voters and hopefully uh, get them to vote for them. But one of the challenges, I think, is the numbers game, right? And um, I think Democrat campaign managers and candidates will say, look, it, I can spend my time in a big city, in a bigger city, in a town with a number of residents that I think I can get to vote for me, or I can go work and try and get rural voters uh, who I have to go and spend a lot of time to try and talk them into me. Why, why not go, you know, as they say, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why not stay with the, the city and urban folks to, to get, the, get into office. What's the cost at doing that for the Democratic Party? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's certainly a whole lot easier to, to pay for TV ads in a big metropolitan market than it is to invest that money in grassroots organizing. But, but the cost is really steep. You know, if um, if you're only concerned about the statewide vote, then squeezing as many votes as possible out of the most populous areas um, might make sense, but it's at the cost of losing state legislatures and sending overwhelmingly Republican delegations to, to Congress like, like we have in my home state of North Carolina, where we have a Democratic governor, but Republican supermajorities and, and an overwhelmingly Republican um, Congress delegation. So, Chloe, what's 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 your advice to the Democratic Party? Um, how how do they change focus? That they have. I mean, it was clear from the Hillary Clinton loss, and it, I don't think that it's gotten any better. That ignoring you ignore the rural voter at your own peril. Um, have they gotten better at paying attention to rural voters? Uh, and if not, what should they be doing? Well, there's certainly a lot of folks all across the country, rural progressives, rural young folks who are running for office and winning and having these conversations. And that's that's so exciting and really should should be honored. You know, we stand beside all the incredible rural organizers in this country and we need a lot more. And, and it sounds so simple, but the heart of it is really just having conversations with people. I think things are so divisive these days and, and so complicated. I don't know of a way to, to overcome that and build a relationship that, that's worthy of a vote, which is a really sacred thing, unless we go door to door and just have an honest conversation with people. Um, you, you write a bit about um, how suspect the rural voter is, um, not just of the, the Democratic Party, but of the Republican Party as well. What, what do the parties, what do the elected officials and the candidates need to do in order to be engaged with the rural voter and the rural citizens? I think it's... I think it's you know, oh. <laughs> it's really about, it's really about gra back to grassroots organizing. We, we have to go and have face-to-face -face conversations. We we canvass so much in the cities and suburbs and people are honestly tired of it. Whereas if you drive down that dirt road and find these folks that we've been talking to for the last several years, so many of them say, I've never been contacted by a democratic campaign or any politician ever before in, in my life. And that conversation means so much more. Um, so we really have to invest in, in building out that, that grassroots infrastructure. Chloe, can you touch on it a little bit, but I'm wondering if you can expand on um, the issue. We, we, and I think that the operatives and politicos and, and those of us who cover it sometimes break down the federal lawmakers and then local, and, and we separate them. But, you know, as we're seeing certainly with the potential of the reversal of Roe v. Wade and the vote today uh, with senators not codifying Roe v. Wade into a federal law, um, we have a big imbalance in, in the country with the number of people who are represented, represented by some senators and then others who are not, and that the state lawmakers um, who are regularly conservative and Republican are the ones who are going to be calling the dance card as we move forward. How, what's the connection there between connecting with rural voters that will have an impact on national and federal lawmaking? 
it's, you know, it's really all connected. And, and I think it's, it's a connection that's becoming more and more prominent these days, but, you know, there is so much power in state legislators, legislatures, but, you know, over the, during Obama's presidency, the Democrats lost almost a thousand legislative seats nationwide. And in that, in that same time span, rural voters went from a nonpartisan voting preference to a 16 point Republican advantage. So there's been a wild swing and the consequences Consequence of that is more influence on the national level and at the state level as well. And so Democrats have really kind of lost ground in some of the key races that, that we've historically relied on. And like Canyon says, with the example of North Carolina, if you have a Democratic governor, but a Republican legislature, the issues that we care about from reproductive rights to climate justice to racial justice, we are not going to advance these, these extremely vital important policy causes unless we have good Democrats in office. Canyon, the, the narratives about uh, rural voters, um, which which you write about in the book also, is, you know, that they vote against their own best interests. You know, you've got some of the poorest counties and poorest states uh, voting for Republicans who are turning around and not helping them not be poor anymore. Or uh, you quote the, the, the Hillary Clinton quote about uh, a, a basket full of deplorables, and you note the Barack Obama, you know, clinging to their guns, uh, and, and this really dismissive view that not just Democrats, but Republicans too, but we're talking about Democrats, have about the rural voters. How can something that seems so steeped in the narrative of our nation, how can you get Democrats to, to change that thought process? Yeah, I, I think it's hard. I think, I think that we need to hear more stories out of rural c communities and from rural campaigns. I, it's, it's frustrating to, to see folks voting for for Donald Trump, and and it's I think it's a natural human reaction for for folks to kind of other make people into the other who disagree with them, um, and it's just it's just about fighting back against those stereotypes and against those narratives and and changing the messaging to lead to lead with values and the significant common ground that we do have when we get out of the Twitter sphere, get out of our. Facebook feeds and, and Fox News and just have a face-to-face -face conversation. Chloe, in the book, you guys, you know, you, you, it's a how-to book as well. It's not just a what happened, but it's also a how-to for folks who are interested in um, uh, running for office, but also for Democrats uh, to read. Um, what's, what's your take on what has to happen right now? We seem to me, at least from my viewpoint, to be in a really awful position when it comes to protecting our democracy and getting people involved in voting. Um, what, what would be your advice to someone considering running for office right now who's motivated by the need to protect, protect the democracy? There's, there's no question the stakes have never been higher. And, you know, there's, there's so many lessons that we've extracted from our work and what work, what works in Maine may not work in other places, but I think one of the, the common themes that we've had in our campaigns and our work in Maine and in other states is the vital importance of talking to people and not just the people who already agree with us, but the folks who might think about the world a little bit differently than we do. We can't keep just relying on, on, uh, on having folks with the same letter next to their name vote for us. We need a broader movement that's more durable, more sustainable, more reflective, and more inclusive. We're only going to do that if we have face-to-face -face conversations. It's a long process. It's a it's a painstaking process, and it's a hopeful process. But I also think it's very necessary. Can you? What happens when people get elected? That um, you know, I was I was shocked at uh, about how how some elected officials, especially on the federal level, seem completely disconnected by how inflation is impacting. All families of on every every rung on the economic ladder, you are feeling um, the inflation. And uh, as an issue for the midterm election for the Democrats to actually win, it's something that even though there's not a lot of president could do about it, I would be out talking about it every day. What happens when they get elected that they forget that they actually, you know, are talking to people who have to pay their bills every day? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't have the answer answer for that, but you know, I, I mean, I think you look at the makeup of of Congress. You look at the makeup of our state legislatures, and um, they're overwhelmingly 
wealthy or retired, you know, old white men. And we need to change that. We need more, more people like Chloe, more young women, more people of color in office, more working class folks um, who, who aren't just getting there because they're independently wealthy and have funded, funded their own campaigns. Yeah, that's a whole nother chapter in your book, which we can get to. And Chloe, I would imagine your advice to folks would be that step toward people who are different from you and disagree with you rather than step away from them. Yeah, embrace the difference. There's there's so much power in agreeing to disagree and even just understanding where someone else is coming from, even if they're not going to vote for you. All right, Chloe Maxman, Canyon Woodward, thank you so much for joining me. I enjoyed the book and I recommend it for everyone to read it right now, especially as we are in this dangerous time. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you so much. The book again is Dirt Road Revival, How to Rebuild Rural Politics and Why Our Future Depends on It. Look, at a lot of people have picked up a new hobby or two during COVID shutdowns, but five local moms took things to a whole new level. They started a rock band that took them from a Milton basement to national television. They're called the Lazy Susans, and this past Monday, they performed one of their original songs, Sugar Drop, on the Kelly Clarkson Show. Aha! I'm joined by four of the five Lazy Susans. I'm going to let you introduce yourselves and tell me what you play. Joanna, starting with you. I'm Joanna Weiss. I play guitar. I'm Layla Mitchell, and I do percussion and keys. I'm Imge Geronaldo. I do keys and bass. I'm Heather Shaw, and I play bass. And you also may recognize Joanna as a contributor here to uh, GBH, among other places like the Experience Magazine. Welcome to, how exciting is this? My God, I am so excited for you. What happened? I mean, I have a guitar that I borrowed uh, when COVID happened, and it is still sitting exactly where it might have a piece of clothing on it. It may have turned into a hamper or two. How did you guys take this love of music and actually turn it into something during the pandemic? We set a deadline. <laughs> I think that was the that was the key. Um, we got together. We'd always kind of talked about playing music. It was something that we liked, even though we didn't have any ex or very much experience among us. Um, but for years, our husbands would play music. Our kids were in bands. Our kids were in plays. We thought it looked fun. But we thought, well, you know, who has the time to do that? And then the pandemic hit. Yeah, I mean, I think that the pandemic gave us the opportunity to not honestly have to run the kids around and actually physically go places. So we were in our house and we were kind of quarantined to get quarantining together. And I think part of it was like, what are the what are the opportunities that we can do, do things that we've always dreamed about doing? So that that was sort of the start of it. MG, I'm going to start with you and ask you, tell me what your prior experience, I want each of you to go, we'll go with uh, MG and then to Heather and then back around again. Tell me, kind of like a lazy Susan, get it? <laughs> um, <laughs> tell me what your prior yeah. musical experience was before doing this. Um, so I grew up playing piano a little bit, uh, so I had some classical music training um, and I... In college, many, many moons ago, I dabbled in some uh, bands as well. Heather? Uh, zero. I had, like, <laughs> no musical experience at all. Never picked up an instrument in my life. Joanna? So I had taken guitar lessons a tiny bit in my 20s, and my husband had taught me a few guitar chords, but I never, besides him, I'd never played in front of anyone who wasn't, who I wasn't paying. To <laughs> and Layla? I'm a pretty strong karaoke singer. Um, I like to, you know, we like to get together and uh, like to pretend like we're the best singers doing karaoke. And Martha, our our fifth uh, Lazy Susan, really had zero uh, musical experience. And we gave her some sticks and she just went at it and got some great lessons. And yeah, it's not like it's important. Drumming is like not at all important for a rock <laughs> band. Just go ahead here. You just go ahead and hit the drum. You her on the team. Right, right. <laughs> well, yeah. we're going to take a look. You guys played at the J.P. Porch uh, Fest thing, so we're going to take a look at this. Now that we've set the stage for folks and gave them a little taste from the Kelly Clarkson show, take a look at this. See the people walking down the street. That, of course,
just at JP, uh, JP Porch Fest. You know what I love about the fact that we're listening to a Go-Go's tune um, is that they often have talked about how many of them didn't know how to play their instruments until they went on the road. And listening to your songs really struck me of that, that sort of punk era um, and, and how many bands have become so successful and not letting the fact that they didn't know exactly how to play be a barrier. What gave you the courage to go ahead and go forth with that in that mode? Yeah, it was Milton Porch Fest. Just want to. Oh, I'm sorry. I kept saying JP. It. Thank you, Milton. There are Thank tons you. of Porch Fests around, right. um, and 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 there, it's it's an amazing thing because it kind of has the vibe of an open mic. I mean, it's it's a really friendly Accepting. local crowd. It's neighbors who want you to do well and want to support you. So we set that date on the calendar because we figured if we didn't set a date, we would never do it. And if we didn't have something to motivate us like fear of humiliating ourselves in front of our friends and neighbors, we would never get it done. And I mean, of course, acting like an editor in chief, both correcting me and putting a deadline in place, which gets it going. And I think I just booked you for the JP Porch Fest. So. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. Heather, I think you're going to say something. I, I was saying we've heard a lot over the last few months that it's not necessarily about the height of the talent. It's more about the excitement and the passion that you put into your music and kind of getting the crowd. So we're going to ride on that a little bit. And we're building our talent as we're going, of course. But I think that the I think that the excitement that we kind of bring to the stage and even that a little bit nervousness, too, sort of sets us a little bit different than those that have had a lot of practice over the last well you're 10. definitely underselling yourselves because if you had <laughs> i had uh, seriously i mean i i thought that you had all played before the, uh, nothing strikes me as you know these are just folks goofing around this is really very good music played very seriously with a lot of fun and enthusiasm um where did you f I know that we were in lockdown, but where did you find the energy to do this, to commit yourself to this? Because that, that to me, when I think, when we get on the other side of this, when I look at the pandemic, I'm just going to think of this weight I had on my shoulders and this dread I felt the whole time and seeking something that brought me joy, which you successfully did. How did you find the energy to do that? Energy, energy. Uh, <laughs> I can, I can jump in. I mean, for me, uh, you know, I was, I was on my computer a lot because I'm a professor. So I was teaching online and, you know, my husband had given me the base for um, Christmas of 2019. And so, and it was just collecting dust. I hadn't really touched it because I hadn't played anything before. And so for me, it gave me an opportunity to be creative in a very different way than I, than I had before. So for me, it was it was an outlet. I looked forward to it. It gave me. It, I was using my brain in a different way than I was as a as a professor. So here's here's the gender studies question, right? Um, a bunch of I'm sure a lot of dads got together and made bands, uh, and I'm sure a lot of dads on a regular basis uh, go ahead and go to a garage somewhere or go hang out and make music. You know, we're still in a world where it's news that moms got together and did it, right? And um, we're still in a world where a female rock band is newsworthy, like the Go-Go's still fighting to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Debbie Harry's still, you know, out front. What's, what's, what's the gender twist on this? When can we get to a point where I'm thrilled that you're making news and I'm thrilled that you're on the Kelly Clarkson show, but this, this should be just you being artists. It, does it need to be about you being moms and women doing this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a lot about us kind of grabbing it back. You know, I sort of said that, that term, like taking it back, taking out, taking back the thing that we've just been wanting to do. It doesn't have to be singing. It doesn't have to be a band. It could be something that you just had passion for before you became this other identity, which maybe is a parent or an adult or a working person or a working mom. So it was really just about us definitely collaborating and supporting, getting that support from our, from our friends, and then just sort of taking it back and saying, I want to do this thing. And um, whether there's sort of a gender statement or not, I think we just have to support each other as, as moms and as females to sort of take control and go for it. You know, I doing it to go. help too. I think having having people who kept you honest, who kept you motivated, you have to show up not just for yourself, but you have to be accountable to with other people. You got to play it all together. You got to learn your part. You got to you, 
you, you got to be part of the band. Uh, so I think that that's helped a lot. I think the pandemic was created that space for it, but I think the lesson is you have to create your own space for mm -hmm. it. The other inspirational part about it, I used to work in the in the music business, and I was always amazed when people um, put barriers up in order to be creative. Um, and I was reading in the Globe article about it. One of you were saying something like, well, we feel like we might have taken someone's space. We're getting attention for this. There are other people who have been working on this for years. And I actually read the comments, which I weighed into. And one commenter said, listen, you never know what's going to catch fire. You never know who somebody could be working for years and never get it. And then someone comes along and suddenly it's, you know, it's, you've, you've, caught, you've caught it and you've, you're sharing it with the world, which is bringing joy, which you guys are doing. What's next? I mean, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on your way, world tour. What's, what's the dealio? I mean, what's next is uh, picking up for soccer and, <laughs> and doing the grocery and the dinner's got to get on the table. But no. we are playing this Saturday night at the Midway Cafe yeah. in Jamaica Playing. We will be in JP. Yeah. Yes. Saturday yeah. night at 8.30 at the Midway, followed by two other great bands, Robin's Garage and Twice a Day Ray. And uh, and I think we'll be in Hull in a few weeks. And so, like, it's picked up. It's a lot of fun. I think we're really excited about going out to the different communities and, and sharing our story and meeting other people as well. Well, and tell me a little bit about the set. So I know you've got original music that you're doing, but what else can folks look for? We're going to play some more music in just a bit so folks can get a taste. But what, what are you playing? What's on the set list? We've got five originals. Yeah. Um, and then we've got, what, a little bit of Pat Benatar. we got a little bit of Lizzo. we got a little bit of Donna uh, Summer, Donna Summer from back. Manchester. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, thank you for, I'm so thrilled about this. I can't even tell you. I think I might have to make my way out uh, to see you guys. Congratulations on making something good out of the pandemic. And um, I'm so thrilled that my guitar is working so well as, uh, as a, a, a closet piece right now, but I might get inspired. So thanks so much for joining me. And we direct folks to look for you on Saturday night. Thanks for joining me. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. My bad. I'm told the Go-Go's were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last fall. Who can remember that? But finally, they got in. That's it for tonight, but come back tomorrow. 23 years ago, a woman gave $100 to two young refugees she just met on a plane. Now they've been reunited on Twitter, and they join us to talk about how that single act of kindness changed both their lives. That and more tomorrow at 7, and we're going to leave you now with a little more of the Lazy Susans. <laughs>